Hi, I'm Tommy Moore from the Bartitsa Lab, and in this video I wanted to go over a relatively common weapon known as the Yawara stick. Yawara is an old Japanese synonym for jiu-jitsu, close combat. And early jiu-jitsu obviously had lots of knife work, bludgeon work, as well as the grappling. It was very, very holistic, very integrated. Uh, in the 1940s, an American police officer of Japanese descent, Frank A. Matsuyama, he essentially repopularized the Yawara stick, um, back then made of Bakelite style plastics. And the Yawara stick is essentially characterized by being a small blunt weapon. Uh, this is a small Yawara stick. Uh, as you can see, it's got a grip in the center, it's got a bulbous end at the top, and a spiky end at the bottom. Uh, they're based on Buddhist religious objects, essentially. So you've got elements where you've got a barbell style shape, so a central shaft and two ends, and they're used in all manner of religious ceremonies and symbolism and so on. Um, but when it comes to compliance and self-defense and self-protection and police and security work, the UR is typically weaponized and it's something like this, okay? This would be a very, very small version. Larger versions may be a bit like this torch here. Imagine this end, but also at the top. So again, you've got a really robust tool. Now, they're illegal to carry in a form like this because this is clearly a weapon by design. It is intended to be a weapon. So in the UK, we can't carry things like this legally. But it's important to learn some of the characteristics and the techniques of a tool like this because if so necessary and if so contextually viable, if you're in sufficient danger and there's no other recourse, you may wish to use some of the techniques with everyday objects. And I'm going to go through some of the techniques using some of those everyday objects. Now again, key characteristics of the Yawara is that a bit comes out the bot top and a bit comes out the bottom. So you've got a weaponized element in either end. What is also important is that this, this technically gives you a loaded fist. When your fist grabs something tightly, it tends to give you a more secure punching platform. You can punch with a bit more confidence. You know, it doesn't turn this into a block of concrete, but it takes away all those little gaps you might normally have. So obviously you've got three weapons really when you look at the Yawara. You've got the top, the bottom, and you've still got the fist in the middle, which now has made even more viable. So things to think about here. Now, reasonable substitutes for this. A very simple one would be a marker pen. Something like this, I can hold in the middle, I can use from the bottom, from the top, and I can use my fist. You can use all manner of pens. You can use all manner, you know, you're attacked in your home and you're sat watching TV, your remote control can be used in this way, nice and simple. Or indeed, in a very familiar way, with a torch, you wanna to make sure you've got a robust tool. Don't buy a cheap torch, but if you're gonna buy a nice torch, again, you've essentially got nine tenths of a Yawara here. Uh, so I'm gonna use the torch for demonstrations in this purposes. Obviously, it's got the added benefit of being a torch. It's a useful implement. It's, an, it's a thing you could have on you, but in a smaller scale, any degree of chunky pen will do the same thing. So. Yawara, weaponized version, albeit small, improvised version, albeit large. Ways in which you can use it. So, if you're looking, you wanna be able to draw this in extremis. So whether you're looking at it from a historical perspective, how it might have been used by law enforcement, or if you're looking for substitutes that you might use today, you wanna to be able to access this in the easiest possible way. So an important thing with any practice tool that you're working with, you know, What's it like from a pocket drawer? You know, how dangerous is it to have my hand in this pocket if a situation is going to kick off? It's very dangerous. So do I need to build in if I sense danger? I've already thumbed it. I've already got it here. I've already got the weapon inconspicuously. I say weapon, object. You know, In this instance, it's a perfectly legal, justifiable object to have on you. Again, it may be that you could practice subtly drawing this if you have the right awareness to sense the danger. In the middle of a fight, the fight's already happening, no way am I gonna scramble around for this. If the fight's happening, the fight's happening. Only at a place of extreme distance would I feel comfortable enough to draw this. So the first thing is get canny to awareness and observation, and obviously exit the scene at the first possible opportunity. If you can't do that and you can't de-escalate, it's important if you do think of using a tool or something to support you, especially if there are multiples or you suspect there may be weapons, you know, get used to the notion of being able to hold these things by stealth. Having these things already drawn in your hand, under your arm, you know, 
in an inner pocket somewhere where you can easily access and use this. And each person and each thing you wear, differences in what you wear will dictate how easy it is to get something like this off your person. So let's assume drill one is practice being able to draw it in advance, keeping your awareness and having it subtly on you. The great thing about a weapon of opportunity is it works better if it's a surprise. If he pulls out a knife and I pull out a torch, he's, <laughs> he's not going to give a fuck. You know, if he pulls out a knife and then you suddenly hit him with a hard piece of metal, that's a surprise. You, know, you want to surprise him with this if you need to, if it's legally justifiable. But again, using the torch analogy, get used to having it out before you really need it. Because again, it's a reasonable object to have out, to just linger around. Same with the pen, pencil, yep. remote control if I'm in my house. If someone, you know, if someone knocks on the door and you want to answer the door and you don't want to be holding a weapon, but you want something there, take your remote control with you. Take your remote control, hold it nice and hard. It's tough plastic, it's got batteries in it, it's got a bit of weight, it's going to do pretty decent damage. So get used to drawing it before you need it. If you've drawn it and you still don't need it, and you might not ever need it, again, make sure that you're not spurring something on. You know, don't hold it like it's a weapon. Just have it casually, still maintain all the good practices of offence, verbally de-escalate, try and exit scene, all that kind of stuff. But if you do need to use it, you'd much rather it be an absolute surprise. So again, let's take shots with the bit that comes out the top. A couple of different examples for these. Easy ones will be circular shots, shots that come on the same trajectory as a hook. So you're still using the same body mechanic as a hook. You're still using your hips, your shoulders, your feet. Boom! You're still blasting this in. And don't get lazy with your targeting. Just because it's a weapon doesn't mean you can be lazy. So in this instance, you might be thinking jaw. So from a subtle position, you may block him off at the fence, you may persist, whoop, you launch this round, boom, exactly from where it is, you don't need to wind it up, boom, use the hip, use the shoulder, use the knee, nice, simple, circular shot, that's quite good if you're up close, so it's already got to the nasty stage, and you want something to come around his field of vision, whoop, it may well be that we're just prior to that. Now, bear in mind, if there's a gap, I can still move out of the way. If, if he's still here, I can keep maintaining that distance and moving off. So, you know, when we're here, it's a different story. This is dangerous all the time. If I'm just outside of reach, or just at the extreme end of his reach, there's still great opportunities for me to just fuck off. So fuck off. Um, but sometimes that can't happen. So if you're at the extreme end, you know, a circular shot will be seen and covered easily. So again, you'll want from a subtle position, the ability to blast it straight forward. <laughs> Just launch it from here, as if it were a jab or a cross. Boom, use your hip, boom, use your shoulder, boom, don't wind it up. Just boom, from here. Bang, fire that straight in. Boom, into the throat or into the jaw, or into the solar plexus, or into the groin, depending on the level of force necessary. The minimum level of force for you to exit the scene safely. So it may well be, it's a solar plexus job. Boom! Then get gone, nice and simple. Bang! Still using all of the discipline I would use if I was punching him. I've just got this extra element here. Bam! Right into the solar plexus. So solar plexus, throat if it's extremely dangerous, Jaw, groin, all of these things can be done at relatively long range. But again, practice doing it via stealth. Just launch it straight in. Boom. Use your hip, use some drop step kind of pressure to it. Nice and simple. Or if up close, that hook really does the business. Again, nice and simple. If you're very, very close, an upper cut style motion, using the tip here can also work. But I would advise slapping the back at the same time. Bam, hammer that in, lock the forearm, boom, fire that shot in. Imagine there's a knife on your hip and you're stabbing him with it. So again, if you're in this kind of crowded, horrible tangle here, it might be, you just get the torch out, fire that shot in, that might be all you need. So long range, 
we've got these penetrative jab cross star motions extreme close you've got these uppercut star motions mid-range take your hands outside of his fence or shift your body outside of his fence outside of his shoulder zone Boom! fire that in using the top tip here a lot of people talk about using these against limbs as they're being punched no one's that fast really you're never going to pull it off don't worry about it if you're going to use this typically it'll be a tool of preemption in there it's kicked off you notice there's three of them you've got fuck all on you but i've got my torch because i'm walking my dog at night make sure i've got that handy to access still try and escape and evade and de-escalate and if you can't or if you're forced then boom boom you know move fast don't let them see the weapon never hold it out as if it were a weapon Just boom move with it be ballistic straight shots pop so from a relaxed position pop hooking shots pop pop and uppercut shots pop. boom nice and simple easy stuff then you've got the bottom end so again the bottom end is for more mid-range work or close range work. If you wanted a long range attack from the bottom end, you can essentially spike it out forward like this. So this might be an attack to the eye. Boom! So you launch it, pop. Launch it, pop. But again, it's a high level of force technique, jamming something hard into someone's eye. So you wanna make sure you're legally sound and robust and justifiable in doing so in a deadly kind of force level threat scenario. Boom! Can jam that again from relaxed, bang, right into the eye, bang, bang, that's an option. Of course you can take that level of force down just by keeping the technique but changing your targeting. So it may be I go for the jaw, boom, boom, it may be that I go for the throat, again this is higher level of force, so pop it into the throat, very high force, into the eye, high force, into the jaw, mid force into the solar plexus boom yeah relatively low force so that kind of thrusting penetrative shot with the bottom of the weapon is also very very useful once you're in mid-range however it really falls into the territory of edge of hand blows or hammer fists everything you can do with a hammer fist you can do with a yawara stick so again very easy one to practice down on the collarbone low level of force Bang! Sink your body weight. Bang! Collarbone. Boom! You might want to do a horizontal shot across his jaw. Bang! Come here. Bang! Come here. Just crunch it straight across his jaw. Coming around. Or you may wish to come directly down onto the chin. Bang! Bang! But all of these things need to have the same usage of the legs and the hips and the shoulders making sure that you're carrying mass and power with it you know this doesn't make you superman it's just an extra five percent on top of your game an extra ten percent it's an extra leveler should you need it should the situation dictate it you've got a legal thing that you can use if the situation warrants it and if you've exhausted your ability to retreat de-escalate evade escape yada 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 pop to the eye Pop to the throat, pop to the chin, same technique, different targets for different levels of force. Um, but once you're up close, anything you can hammer fist, you can do with this. But, but remember not to wail on him, not to get so close and be like, meh, meh, meh. Yeah, be clinical. So if you're going to take him, let's say we're going to go straight on the button down his jaw, you know, take the time to do it properly. Whom! You know, sink your body weight, use your shoulder use the weapon percussively don't just flail and just hit lumps of face you know in reality you still want to go for structurally important targets i want to shake his brain by attacking his jaw <laughs> so make sure you've got the right mass and force and speed and power behind it as if the weapon weren't there because what if it slips out your hand what if you miss what if it slides down your hand you still want the same level of efficacy Either way, you don't have to learn too many techniques. That's why I always talk about targets, not techniques for the level of force. You know, high level of force, bang, you might punch him in the throat, life and death. Mid level of force, bang, might punch him on the jaw, hopefully knock him out. Low level of force, 
bam! 17 year old scallywag breaks into my house. You take him in the solar plexus. It doesn't really matter. The technique's still the same. I'm targeting. Get used to targeting well. It's very important. But either way, if we go back to the yawara or things that are like the yawara, you've got the top end strikes, which come in hook form, straight form, and uppercut form. And you've got the bottom end, which come in eye spike or eye thrust form, or indeed throat, very high levels of force. You've also got hammer fists to the collarbone, the jawbone, but making sure that the body travels with it. It's very, very, very important. If you're in hyper close range, yes, you can use these to prize people off. So you can dig this behind the ear and you can make a bit of space. But I would caveat this in that it can make a bit of space, but you still need all the fundamental grappling knowledge to survive here. If we're in a grapple, having this won't turn me into a BJJ black belt. So, you know, I still need to have the wherewithal to keep my base, keep my balance, put him off balance. You know, I still need to understand how to combatively move, sprawl, resist, evade. I still need to be able to do all of those things unarmed. This might be the extra persuader I use to dig him somewhere, to move him, but I can't stand like a pleb here and expect that to move him. I still need to be relatively based and strong and balanced. And then I can use this for just extra spice in that scenario. So whilst, yes, you can use it to push against sensitive spots, under the jaw, behind the ear, into the throat, into the collarbone, into the groin, whatever. Really, it's about making sure that you've got position and strength and balance before you use that tool, should you need to. So again, some simple techniques, mostly percussive using the front end and the back end. And obviously, as I said at the start, you can still use the central part of your fist if you need to. Often, it's actually a great support having something in the hands. Okay. As with all weapons, uh, due care and compliance are necessary. Make sure you're legal in your areas. If you are in a country or a place or a state where you can carry a wara, cool. Get a fit for purpose one. You may as well, um, amongst other tools. But if you don't, bear in mind that all of these techniques, when you drill them, when you practice them, you can do it with a torch, a pen, a pencil, mark a pen, this, you know, my favourite. Learn to do these things with your mobile phone. Grab a lump of your phone, bottom edge, top edge. Now you can do quite significant damage with the hardened plastic and glass of your mobile phone and it's on you all the time. It still has the characteristics, or many of the characteristics, of the Yawara. So that's very important. And then when you're drilling it, make sure you practice it against bobs so you get used to anatomical targeting or friendly partners, get used to knowing accurately where you want this stuff to go, get used to practicing at full force, full speed, you, know, you, want, you want the first time you've done this with aggression to be the time you need it the most. Okay, once you've moved off from that, you can start to move into a bit of dynamic pad work by yourself or with a partner, flash the target, smash it, make sure the opponent is tall enough to be realistic to the kind of person that would attack you. I'm 6364, so anyone that attacks me is likely to be a fair bit bigger. It's unlikely for him to be much smaller. He might be about six foot, but it's unlikely a five foot five person is really going to go for me all that often. So again, be realistic with the heights and the angles from the side, from behind. So if I spot him from behind, still got this in the natural sense, whoom, can smash it in. From the side, whoom, can smash it in. From the front, whoom, using all of the body mechanics which are necessary. So bob work, human work, pad work, and once the situation allows, make sure you do some sparring with it too, but don't just go at each other with lumps of foam and make sure it's foam. High density, but make sure it's squishy. Make sure you're masked up appropriately, but get used to be able to do this preemptively as a surprise from a position of the weapon being unseen. That's its main usage. If I hit that and there's still more people to fight, Absolutely, I can just continue as if I'm boxing. This is just in my hands. I don't need to do anything special. But my first couple of shots should always operate off the position of this being subtly drawn and subtly held. Hopefully you found that useful. That's a little bit about the Yawara and how modern versions and modern improvised weapons can do the same trick.